All righty. Do a little test here. Everything good on your end, Daisy? Yep. All good. Killer. So we've got about three minutes and we'll get started on all of this. Um, Kyle, you've got all the panels and everything set up and ready to go? Yes, I do. I'm uh, doing the share to Facebook and then we'll be ready. Excellent. I just wanted to check your audio for when we get uh, questions coming in. It's like we've already got some chat starting. That's good. Just a couple minutes away for everybody that's already uh, tuning into this, and we'll get we'll get rocking with our second webinar about ground reaction forces. Turn this off. Just like last time too, um, if anybody does have any questions during the uh, presentation, Kyle's going to be keeping those, so he'll be hosting this. If you want to throw those directly in chat, or you could uh, you know, send a direct message through Zoom to Kyle, he can uh, have your questions ready to go. We're going to answer a bunch of those today. All right. There's a question coming about, um, will you get a copy of the recording? Yes, you will. That will be sent out tomorrow, a link for all those who missed it, or you want to forward the link to someone you think may want to watch it, that will be emailed tomorrow. Kyle, we're looking at about 30 seconds. We good to go on Facebook and everything else? Yep. All righty. Here come the questions. We had record signups and turnout for this today. I think we were over 800, right, Daisy? Yep. We're excited. So the, the recording for the first webinar is still available. If you want that, then shoot an email to info at superspeedgolf.com and we'll send you the link. Okay, I think we're ready to get started here. Um, well, everybody, thank you for coming to attend our second Super Speed webinar. Uh, we're really excited. We get some really cool information, I think, to clear up maybe some of those confusing topics when we start to talk about ground reaction forces and how that can affect the golf swing. There's so much great information of, about this topic out there. I just think a lot of it, you know, you need about three college degrees to really sort through to get really to the bottom of what's going to become practical with that information uh, for everybody. So we're going to hopefully today take you through some of the basics of ground reaction force, uh, look at some different ways that we measure it and different things that we can do with our super speed drills and protocols to really help you get the most out of your golf swing to maximize it. Um, as we get started here, we are going to be doing some screen share presentations tonight. It's a little different than we did last time. Um, so you will see some slides coming up. You should still be able to see us talking um, in the smaller uh, pictures in the corner. And then as, as last time, please, you know, throw in the questions. We're all about asking, you know, answering your questions about these topics. So we're going to present some information here for about the first 20 minutes or so. And then we're going to open it up live to a whole bunch of different topics. Uh, the first thing that I want to talk about tonight, let me just go ahead and pull these uh, slides up here.
All right. So we're really excited that now we have officially launched our SuperSpeed Certified Program. Um, this program is a three-level online course, uh, really designed to give everybody the background of not only overspeed training, we do go into a lot of great depth, obviously, about our own products, SuperSpeed, the research and de development that went into starting the SuperSpeed brand, how we did it, why we did it, and all of that cool information. Also, best practices on using our products, through all the different levels of our training protocols, uh, customizing that training with our advanced training protocols, and then also moving into a lot of other pieces uh, that are really important to speed training. But one of the really cool pieces that we've launched with the certification program is a model that we call the speed pyramid. So what this is, is this is gonna look not only at all those topics of overspeed training, um, but it's also gonna look at how we interact with the ground below us, so that's gonna be a lot of what we're talking about today with ground force and ground reaction forces. How that is gonna influence and also on its own influences speed, uh, rotational sequencing and kinematics. And then we're gonna look at how all of those affect lag and risk mechanics in the golf swing. These things are the three real big key components to what we need to be able to do in the golf swing to create power. And these things happen on every single swing. Um, we actually have ground reaction data, we have rotational sequencing data, we have risk mechanics data on every shot that you hit in golf. So it's really, really cool to look at this. Um, most of what we're gonna look at today is gonna be specifically about ground reaction force and specifically uh, about driver and more powerful type swings that you're gonna take uh, with the golf swing. Um, I'm going to get this started off here. We're going to talk about some of the background on ground reaction force and some definitions. Daisy's then going to walk you through a whole bunch of really cool information on some more of the practical side. Uh, so let's get started. I would say one of the biggest pieces that we look at is just the definition of ground force or um, you know, ground mechanics, ground force mechanics, ground reaction forces. We talk about all these different things. But the big piece we're talking about here is how does a golfer interact with the turf below them? So how do they connect to that turf? How do they push on that turf? And how does that process of pushing on the turf create reactional forces from the ground, you know, that whole equal and opposite reaction piece that is going to then um, help start the entire chain of rotation in the swing and lead eventually to kinetic energy transferring through the body and out to the club face to hit a golf ball. Now that's the first big piece we like to talk about with this is what is energy? So energy or kinematic or, or kinetic energy is actually just energy that anything has because it's in motion. So if I was to take a ball of any kind, a baseball, let's say, and throw it at the wall, when I throw that ball, because it's traveling at a certain velocity through the air and it has a certain amount of mass, it's going to end up with a certain amount of energy that can get transferred when that body touches something else. So if it touches the wall, that energy is going to transfer into the wall and then Again, by our you know, law of equal and opposite reaction, the wall is essentially going to press back at the ball and there's going to be a force relationship there. So this is kind of the basis of everything we're going to talk about today with ground reaction force. You know, the big piece here is that when a golfer does this, we're stealing energy from the ground and that energy is then going back up through our body to start the whole chain of events that allows us to be powerful in the golf swing. Here's an example, if we watch this video, it's gonna be a little choppy here at the beginning, but it's gonna show a couple pieces. But basically what we're seeing here is three balls falling from the ground. So each one of those balls, because it's falling, has a certain amount of energy based on its mass and gravity uh, pushing it toward the ground. Once they hit the ground, you know that, that energy is then going to transfer down into the ground and the ground's gonna push back up on the ball. Each one of those balls, because of the different size and mass that they have, is going to have a transfer of energy that goes up through the next segment of this chain. Uh, this, isn't, this isn't exactly like what happens in the golf swing, but a similar example here with different segments and going. And you can see as that ball falls down, there's a lot of energy that gets then transferred and back up. And you can see that the ball actually gets shot way up in the air out of this situation. This is a really important thing when we talk about energy transferring, storing in different segments and transferring through the smaller segments out to the end result here of hitting a golf ball. So let's break this down. I wanna look at exactly how we measure force, first of all. Force is a very interesting thing. And if we all think back to you know, our high school physics class, we learned about something called a vector. 
Now, important things here to vectors is that vectors have two really important characteristics. One of them is going to be magnitude, or how intense is that, is that force that's being represented by that vector. So obviously, the heavier that ball would be falling to the ground, um, the faster it's falling to the ground, the more magnitude we're going to have on the amount of force that's going to be transferred. The other important piece here is direction. So force always is acting in a direction. So this happens in a very complicated way, I would say, in the golf swing, because we're working in three-dimensional force. So that's what this graphic would look at here. So what we're looking at here would be a force vector happening in three dimension. So this is actually what happens every single time we make a golf swing. We are going to be interacting with the ground, producing this, these different 3D force vectors coming away from the ground that are pushing up through our body and creating a lot of different uh, rotational movement and also uh, just direct force and energy traveling through our body. This is what it looks like. So this would be an example of you know, 3D force plates looking and watching a 3D force vector happening at all times. So as you can see, at different points during the golf swing, those force vectors are gonna have different lengths. So that means they're different magnitudes or different intensity. And then they're also gonna be changing direction. So you know, it doesn't always happen in one direction at a time. In fact, it always happens at all of these directions at once. Uh, this is an incredibly important and critical aspect of looking at ground reaction force is what direction and how much of these forces are going to be traveling through our bodies at any time. Now, typically what we do is we break out the components of that 3D force vector. So again, it's, it's complicated to be able to measure in 3D like that all the time. So what we can do is of any 3D force vector, we can break out components. We can say that there's a vertical force component of that. That would be the force that's acting directly up and down on the ground. Uh, obviously, if you, look, if you remember that video now, there's a lot of vertical force happening in, those, in, in that golf swing. There's also an element of lateral force, or you know, for us golfers, that's gonna be working basically away and toward the target. There's also an element of force going to and away from the ball. We call that thrust. So all three of these are incredibly important directional forces that happen during every single golf swing. Now, the other cool part here is that you can also have force that causes rotation. So this 3D force vector also has an element of something we call torque. Torque is going to be that force that actually causes things to rotate. And we can have torque rotating on a bunch of different axes in the golf swing. Uh, we talk about a lot of the one that happens on the ground that starts really our whole rotational chain uh, of the kinematic sequence and the rotational kinematics of our swing. Looking at vertical force in, in particular, because I think this is maybe one of the most talked about, and honestly, it's usually the one that has the most, the biggest component of that 3D vector tends to be vertical force. Um, we can actually see um, on graphs, when we measure this on systems like body track, that we can measure exactly how much vertical force is happening at every different point in the swing. We can measure how much vertical force happens in the trail side, in the lead side, and all of those we can actually add together and we can find total, total vertical force that happens during the swing. In general, we tend to see the maximum point of vertical force happen you know, about halfway down on the downswing, and it tends to be a very strong push into the lead side, especially for your very powerful players. Um, this vertical force component is something that you know, is different for different players and not all players use a huge amount of vertical force in their swing. You know, there are players that do things differently than that, but there are many players that, use, that capitalize in a great way on maximizing vertical force in their golf swing and using that as a huge power source. So the next thing we're gonna do here is uh, Daisy's actually gonna pull up a few things here and talk with you through how this is gonna affect the swing, looking at not only vertical force, but you know, kind of in some more detail, looking at some other definitions that we look at on ground forces and how this is gonna really practically work in your golf swing with our super speed protocols. All right, so this is one of my favorite topics to talk about, ground forces. So thank you guys all for being here. A little introduction, I'm Daisy, for those of you that just joined. Um, so Mike just introduced you on the uh, basics, the not necessarily basic, the, um, the starting material within ground forces. Now I'm going to go through some of the concepts that maybe we've been a bit confused about for a while. So the first thing that I wanted to bring up was the terminology that we commonly use, which is weight shift. And when you actually break down the components uh, within physics, we're looking at two different things. We're looking at 
center of mass and center of pressure. So center of mass can be defined as the balance point within the body or the average location of the body's mass. And um, that moves, but also pressure moves at a different, to a different extent. And it's really important to understand the difference between center of mass moving and center of pressure moving. So what we're looking at here is center of pressure under someone's feet. So the red dot is going to represent the average location of pressure. So this, within this person right here, he's in his backswing, he's probably got about 60% in his trail foot. And what you'll see as you're looking at these body track traces, the pressure maps like a weather radar. So the more intense the pressure, the more intense the uh, vertical force as well. So center of pressure is actually defined as the average location of vertical force. So if you can time the rate at which you exchange your pressure from your right side to your left side, you can optimize how much vertical force you're producing, which consequently leads to more energy production and faster swing speeds. So this is a good example of the difference between center of pressure and center of mass. So we like to use a sprinter coming up the blocks. The reason why is because you can see significantly here that his center of pressure and his center of mass are very far apart from, he, from each other. You can see as he's pushing out the blocks, his center of pressure falls under that back foot, but his center of mass is way out here in front of him. Now in the goal swing, this does happen, not to that extent, obviously we don't want to almost fall over in our swing, but most powerful players are actually applying pressure through their lead side in the transition while keeping their center of mass backwards and that the distance that you can create um, the difference between those two points can help with acceleration. Let's take a look at Justin Thomas's swing and what I want you to do here is just to watch his feet and watch what happens as he aggressively transfers his pressure into his lead side. So aggressive to the fact that he actually jumps off the ground so he's actually watching that again Watch in transition, he transfers to his trail side nicely. And in transition, he aggressively plants into his left side there, keeps his center of mass back and jumps explosively off the ground. This is something we're seeing more commonly in tour players, especially those that don't weigh, uh, that don't weigh a lot. So let's break it down. So that swing we just saw, we're now going to take a look at the pressure trace. Um, we actually have Justin Thomas's pressure trace on the body track. And we're going to look at a comparison using the yellow arrow to show where his center of pressure is and the red arrow to show where his center of mass is. So just looking at this visual representation here of his feet, it's a bird's eye view. So imagine like you're looking down at the feet. So the left foot is here. And on the left side, 46% at setup, and the right side, 54% at setup. And you can also see he's favoring his right toe. You can see those two numbers on the right half of that pressure graph, 67%, and actually 61% in his left heel. So this is at setup for him. Now, everyone's different. It's very important to know that everyone's trace is going to be very individual and it's all about optimizing the trace to what you can physically do. All right, so set up the center of mass and center of pressure are fairly in the same place. As he takes the club away, what you'll see is the pressure loads into his trail side, denoted by that yellow arrow, and you'll see 65% here. And that center of pressure trace, the ball, is moving where, where the average pressure is located. So right now it's on his right side because it's got 65% on his right side. At the top of the backswing, you'll see he gets a little bit more pressure into his trail side, loads up to 70. And you'll see that his center of pressure and center of mass have moved slightly nearer to each other. In transition, as I was saying, he aggressively transfers into his left side. Now, what you're seeing, he's actually got 81% pressure in his left side. And I mean, the club's barely moved in the downswing. So that's a great uh, trait of the faster 
uh, club speeds. So 81% in his trail side. And what's cool is that you'll see his center of mass starts to, starts to move backwards. And it's that separation that allows him to accelerate. In his follow through, you'll see it move nicely through to the lead side, 82%, and his center of mass and center of pressure fall over that lead side. So let's just take, let's take a step back. So all those great things that Justin was doing, aggressively transferring into his lead side, transferring pressure from trail to lead, all of these things you can work on yourself by doing our ground force specific drills. So we've created these advanced speed development protocols that you can find on our new website. If you go to uh, superspeedgolf.com, tap on the training, and then you can go to our advanced speed development protocols and you'll see a full outline in there. But more specifically, what I want to talk about today is the drills and how they specifically target improvements in ground force mechanics. So let's start with the step change because that's one that you've all probably done within uh, our first protocol, which is now the level one protocol. So this is in slow motion, breaking it down. So you swing back, step out aggressively, and then swing through. So this is not this is not only helping with the rate at which I'm transferring the pressure into that lead side like Justin did, but by stomping aggressively, it's also helping with those vertical forces in a downswing that helps move energy up the chain to the club. So some common mistakes that we usually see with the step change is that people step out too late, which prevents the transfer of energy coming from the ground up, or they step out too far. Now, the, the corrective for that is to step out with that lead side before you start the downswing and to plant aggressively into that lead side and to not step out too far. You want to just step out just the same stance width as you would if you were setting up to a driver. So as long as you're not stepping out too wide, because when you step out too wide, that stops the hips from rotating and you actually slow down. So just some things to look out for for the step change drill. Moving on to the next drill, which is only in this advanced protocol, it's the step back drill. So the step change drill is working on aggressively exchanging the pressure into the lead side. And this one, as you can see, is working on that beginning phase, which is transferring the pressure into the trail side, just like Justin Thomas did. So you'll start with your feet together, step back, swing back and swing through. Combining those two drills together, we get our new drill, which is called the double step drill. So not only do we load the pressure into our trail side, but we wind up and aggressively transfer it through to that lead side. So that's one of our more advanced protocols. And then the last drill from that advanced speed development protocol is called the heel stomp drill. You're commonly seeing this a lot on tour now and um, specifically because it definitely helps not only with the amount of force that you're pushing through that lead hill, but the timing of it too, like Mike was talking earlier, it helps you to start to feel that max push through the lead side in uh, about halfway down, transition to halfway down in um, the downswing. So you see I swing back, lift the lead heel up, slam it into the ground and then swing aggressively through. So this is an example of someone actually doing the heel stomp, Jack Nicholas, and you'll see it a lot, especially with the older population, because it will help them gain more rotation into the backswing. But great example right now, someone you've noticed doing it on tour is Francesco Molinari. So something that he's been specifically working on is his ground forces for the past year or so. He's actually taken his club speed from 107 to 113 purely by working on ground force mechanics. And he actually does the hill stomp and you've probably seen that before. So I'm gonna let Mike take over from now and introduce how these concepts are gonna merge into our next webinar. And then we will take some questions. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks, Daisy. I mean, moving into the, the next segment here, if, if you look back at that speed pyramid model, 
the next piece of this is how a player uses the ground does affect how they're going to be able to create efficient rotational sequencing. Now, to look at this scientifically, we now have to start connecting. Um, it's almost kind of a, a funny uh, play of words here, but connecting kinetic energy and force that's coming up through the body to rotational kinematics, which is not really about force. It's actually just observing the rotational speed of those different segments of the body. So how does that force production from the ground start to really affect the rotational sequencing of the golf swing? Um, we're going to be talking about that in our next webinar and actually going into depth in uh, rotational kinematics. So we're really excited about that for our next program in about a month. Uh, stay tuned to obviously see when exactly that one's going to be, but it will be coming up in about a month from now. Um, on that end, I'd just like to reiterate, there is a lot more of this information available in our SuperSpeed Certified Program, which is available to everybody online. Uh, if you're not a coach or, or you're not interested in being a coach, you can still purchase that content. If you're just interested to learn more about it, uh, you can absolutely purchase that content and go through it. You don't have to become certified at the end of that program. Um, okay, well, I think, uh, Kyle, why don't we toss it back over to you. Um, Daisy, if you want to pop the screen share off, and then we will, uh, we'll, we'll start to get some questions here about ground reaction forces or anything else super speed. Okay, everyone. Uh, we got a lot of questions about the first web webinar recording and the second one. So uh, we have emailed everyone that has asked us for the first one already, and then you'll be sent the second one tonight or tomorrow. Um, I know this is a little more complicated than our first one, but if anyone has some questions, please go ahead and send those to us through the chat or the Q and A. Um, we don't have any questions yet, Mike, that have come in through that except for the ones for the webinar. We have two no hands up. I see. Ground. I yes. see two hands up in the side there, Kyle. Some hands up. Let's see them. Okay, Glenn, we're going to do you first. Glenn, you're on. Let's see. I'm He's gonna... on mute. Un unmute yourself, Glenn. No, I think. No, we're not hearing anything there. Might need to try again there, Kyle. Nothing there. Got another hand. Why don't we try another one? Why don't you try Peter and then Charles? You might have to unmute them, Kyle. Yeah, you might have to tap it from the right. Yep, yeah, it's not. There we go. If you guys want to go ahead and uh, shoot the questions in the chat, we seem to have some difficulties here with some microphones not working. Yeah. There we go, one. Okay, I only have a club head speed of my driver about 90 miles an hour. Um, assuming this will help larger or smaller change. Not sure what that one means there. Okay, yeah, no, I, I think... Um... So here's, here's the deal. When we go back to that speed pyramid model, right? So we have ground reaction force, we have rotational sequencing, we have lag. These th three things interrelate and, and happen for every player every time they swing, okay? Now, not every player, even on the PGA Tour, in many, many instances, maxes out each one of those three components to get the full maximum potential of what they could do uh, from a speed and power standpoint. Um, in many ways, um, in, in many ways, you know, players tend to have deficiencies in one or more of those areas of the speed pyramid. So if you have a player that only swings at 90 miles an hour, now, I mean, there's other things that could be happening there too. You could just not, you could be trying to not swing very aggressively. So, but if you're trying to max out your athleticism and you're swinging at 90 miles an hour, I would probably suggest that there may be some level of deficiency in all three of those categories. Now, what's really important here is that if it happens to be a deficiency with the way you use the ground, with ground reaction forces, I think that's very important to address first because that can affect your ability to sequence efficiently and to uh, create efficient wrist mechanics in your swing as well. So all of those things are related. 
but I would definitely take a look, you know, if you have an opportunity to find a professional in your area that, you know, has a system like body track or another force plate type system that can measure and see if you're efficiently using the ground. Um, it can be a major key in fixing a lot of things down the chain uh, that may be related to the fact that the ground force is not working efficiently. Okay. All right, we've got quite a few questions coming in in chat. Yeah, we're not able to unmute you guys. Um, so if you could just send them in the chat, let's go that way right now. Absolutely, Kyle, just read them off. I'm sitting a little too far away from my screen and honestly, I can't read it. How long do you wait before switching to each club? Should you rest before the final uh, max out swings as well? Go ahead, Daisy. So uh, in between clubs, you're good to just go three swings each side of the green and go straight away three swings each side with the blue, three swings each side with the red, and that's technically end of set one. We recommend taking a 30 second rest before then starting set two, which would be three swings each side with a step change. And then you can take another 30 seconds rest before the last three if you'd like, or you can just go ahead and get them um, then done. Yeah, and just to add a little to that too, obviously everybody that's doing this is going to be starting at potentially a different, you know, level of fitness and athleticism. You know, we, the other way we like to look at this is on the side of if you're using one of our speed radars to measure how fast the super speed clubs go. I usually tell people if two of those swings in a row go down in speed with the same club, you should probably take a little breather just to get yourself back. You know, this training is all about max effort on every swing that you make. So if you get yourself too tired to be able to perform at max effort, you're better off taking a little bit more rest and keeping those swings going at maximum. All right. As a left-handed golfer, um, we're getting some good feedback here on being able to do the trail side and the lead side. So they like that. Uh, if someone is not doing the protocols every week, how do you know when they are ready for the next protocol level? Go for it, Mike. Yeah, so um, if you're not doing it every week, I would still basically count the number of weeks that we recommend on our website for each one of those protocols and do that for that number of weeks. So that means if in level one, you know, you take a week off in the second week and a week off in the sixth week, you probably end up with eight total weeks of level one as opposed to six. Um, that being said, you can always, you know, use your own judgment. If you've taken two or three weeks off, you know, you may want to, you know, kind of start back up and do another week or two of that previous protocol before you just jump right into the next one uh, down the chain. Uh, the only other piece to this that's important is that uh, we talked about this in our first webinar a little bit about the cycle of training. So, you know, whether you're in a normalization phase or you're in a plateau phase, if you're in a normalization phase, I would actually, you know, then if you're right at the start, you know, beginning of the training or getting one of those later jumps, I'd spend a little bit more time with that previous protocol before you move on. If you're in a plateau phase and you miss a week or two, I would just keep going as normal during that plateau phase. All right. So this is one from Charles. Hey, Charles, good to hear from you. Uh, how does the heel stomp drill uh, fit in with what KVest says about having a 40 degree pelvis turn at the top of the backswing? With the heel stomp, I notice that players can turn to 50 to 60 degrees with the pelvis. What are your thoughts? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, so as far as recommends, you know, and, uh, you know, we're very good friends with all of the, the guys at KVest. We've been using that system for, I mean, Kyle and I have been, Daisy have been using KVest, you know, I have at least for about 10 years. Um, I would say this, recommended ranges, whenever you're looking at 3D data, are not the end all and be all of what a player should definitely do in their golf swing. So every player is different. If you have a player, let's say, that has extremely flexible hips, you know, they may see a higher uh, degree of pelvis turn at the top than what is in that green range on KVEST. And that may actually be the most efficient for that player. So I think coupling up what your player is doing and what they can do physically as far as how far their body moves is an incredibly important concept. Where I think, you know, and Daisy mentioned this uh, in an example toward the end of the the. Uh, presentation, I think it's very important, is what we find a lot practically is there's a lot of players, there's, a, there's especially a lot of amateur golfers that have very limited range of motion in their hips. 
And if that's the case, and if it's one of those situations where it's a very difficult type of like hip pathology or, you know, joint issue to actually improve, um, one of the best ways to possibly do that to take stress off of how far the uh, hips have to rotate and lifting that left heel can gain somebody who's lacking a ton of hip rotation, can gain them a lot more to get them into those more normal ranges that will allow them a little more range of motion to have the opportunity to create more speed. So two parts there. Always look at that player. Make sure that, you know, their body does fit the ranges that you're looking at. And don't always look at those green ranges as being, you know, the gold standard of this is always the way it has to be. Because there's plenty of exceptions to those rules where, you know, a player has 50 to your 55 degrees of hip turn. And that's actually the most efficient for that player. All right. I just want to reiterate for those who want us to repeat anything, we will send you the recording of this. If you didn't receive the first one, please email us at info at superspeedgolf.com and we'll get you the first recording right away. Uh, we're having some questions about the importance of the radar. Uh, Daisy, can you just reiterate why we like to use that um, in the training? Yes, yeah, so I love the radar. It's a great motivational tool, number one. Um, but also, it's great to measure and make sure that you're optimizing your speed training. So with the Green Club, and we went over this in the first webinar, but with the Green Club, we want you to hit about 19% faster than your driver speed. With the Blue Club, we want you to hit about 15, and with the Red Club, about 10. And with the radar, that gives you that feedback so that you can make sure that you're optimizing each swing and achieving maximal gains. Also, it gives you a chance to gain um, objective measurements. Let's say you don't have access to a track man or something that's more expensive. This is a very um, reasonably priced product that can actually obtain driver swing speed while hitting a ball as well. So just by shifting the radar over, you can actually obtain driver speed um, as well as super speed club speed. So motivation is definitely a key factor, but obviously objective measurements is the number one way to validate your training. And uh, we want to reiterate that we have some new record keeping sheets on the website in the training protocol page where you can actually track easier how fast you're swinging each club and your driver by using that radar. So go ahead and check those out in the training tab on our website. All right. How can super speed prevent pulling the club down from the top? Awesome. So pulling the club down from the top, and in, in my opinion as a golf coach, um, generally is one of those issues that happens when players are trying to create speed the wrong way. So they're trying to, you know, really use their upper bodies to pull that club as hard as they possibly can to try to create speed. This usually creates a lot of other issues and different types of uh, uh, swing flaws that I would say that would lead to inconsistency, also lead to lack of power. Um, honestly, the bit, it, it's cool that we're talking about ground reaction forces right now because I think some of the best ways to start to work on issues with over pulling of the club from the top or casting an early release on, on maybe even the other side, um, those type of issues tend to be rooted in the way people interact with the ground. And when once the ground is used better and that player is actually creating better uh, ground reaction force, better torque into the ground with the way they're starting their swing, that tends to have a huge component of getting the lower body to help initiate the swing first, um, which is, I would say, in my opinion at least, maybe the number one reason that people have issues with their hands and arms or hands in the golf swing is that the, the lower body's not leading and therefore it doesn't have that support of all the rotational sequencing of the big body segments. And therefore your our upper body and arms kind of have to take over because of the goal of getting the club back to the golf ball. You know, your body's going to make that happen. And if you're not using the lower body in the ground efficiently, you know, generally where most people are going to go to are their hands and arms. You know, as you saw Daisy go through a lot of those drills, including the step change of direction, uh, the double step, the heel stomp drill, all of those drills are incredibly important about working on ground reaction force, but in a couple ways. They're very, they're very key drills to the timing of when does pressure transfer during the golf swing, and also that starts again. When that pressure transfers, it has a huge impact on starting the rotational sequencing of the golf swing. Great. So leading into that, Mike, we've got uh, quite a few people wondering, when do we start these advanced drills? Do we need to have some type of base before that um, to cement that in before we go into these advanced speed development drills? 
Absolutely. I'll, I'll give you an overview and then I'll let Daisy, Daisy walk you through the exact process of what we do with the ASD protocols. But one of the things that we believe in very deeply at Superspeed is, um, you know, kind of discovery learning, but, you know, motor learning that doesn't involve constant cueing from the coaches and doesn't involve just like that, that over coach, over feedback kind of scenario that I think a lot of people have trouble with when they deal with golf instruction. I think, you know, as a golf coach myself, the reason, you know, we, we speak the way we do in our super speed protocols and that there's very simple goals, the very simple goal of make this club move as fast as you can down by that radar um, is a way to have people fix a lot of the issues and deficiencies they have in their golf swing without really ever even having to figure out that they had them. So the point of this is, is this, we, we recommend starting these ASD protocols in the 20th week of our training. Now that means that there's 20 weeks of super speed golf training that happens prior to, to looking at these, let's call it speed pyramid specific drills. And we do that on purpose because in 20 weeks, what we see a lot is that if a player doesn't use the ground very well, doing all these drills that they do in those first three levels of our protocol, there's a high chance that they're going to improve their ability to use the ground. And if they don't sequence well, they're going to improve the way they sequence. And if they don't use their wrists and arms well, they're going to, we're going to see improvements in wrist mechanics and lag. However, if after 20 weeks, you know, we haven't gotten the message across, that person hasn't figured out how to use the ground better and done those things through discovery learning, then we feel that that's the time to intervene and say, if we can identify that you do have a, an area of weakness in the speed pyramid, that, you know, your ground reaction forces are definitely holding you back from more speed gains, now it's time to take some specific action and work on that with those ASD protocols. Uh, Daisy, you want to just touch on, you know, some of the testing that we can do for the, for the uh, uh, at least the ground reaction force protocol and then how that kind of gets implemented into their program. Yeah, so the, obviously the optimal way to measure your ground forces is using a force plate or the body track. Um, but you can also um, measure it using our manual test. So if you just go out and hit five balls on the driving range. I want you to take a look at where your feet were on the ground and see if you actually made any mark in the ground or tore any turf. We actually call this test the manual turf tear test. So you can either do some super speed swings or hit some balls. Just look to see if you have made a mark in the ground. If you haven't, there's a good chance that you don't interact well with the ground. And that's when we recommend you to implement our ASD1 protocol which is the change up protocol for ground forces. You recommend you start in at the bottom of the period, a pyramid and work your way up. So you'll start with the ground, you'll start with ASD1, and then you'll do six weeks. If within six weeks, you can retest yourself every week or every other week. If you pass it, then you're good to go on to the next advanced speed development protocol for sequencing. And the same thing goes with that. Now, one thing I think is important to mention is that you're not gonna do that protocol every day of the week. You're gonna do it once out of the three times per week of training. So once you've done that ground force protocol, you can move on to the ASD2, which is our rebound protocol. And then after that, you can move on to ASD3, which is our sprint protocol. So we'll do a specific webinar in depth on all of our advanced speed development protocols and how to program them in. Um, but more specifically, uh, let's take some questions more about ground force mechanics. You got it. So do we have any exercises if the player is more of a glider versus a spinner versus a jumper? Um, specific exercises with super speed. I, I would say that we just kind of couple all of those things together as areas that you can improve your, your ground reaction force. I, I'd say this is that, you know, it, everybody's swing is different. Everybody's body's different and finding those ways that you can maximize your own potential are going to be slightly different. Mm -hmm. We see more typically that, you know, players that use more vertical force, uh, you know, that, that tends to be, you know, something that happens with a lot of your most powerful hitters in the world. Um, you also see that those players do also maximize rotational sequencing and, and lag and wrist mechanics. Now, that being said, you know, generally players that overuse lateral motion in their golf swing, we tend to see that not be as powerful as those that tend to use more of the vertical element, or I guess you would refer to it as a jumper type swing. I don't like to think of it necessarily as a jumper swing. I feel like that that's maybe the backwards way to look at it from a coaching standpoint. 
my goal when I'm looking at vertical force is I'm trying to press really aggressively into the ground. The more aggressively you press into the ground, remember equal opposite reaction, the ground's pressing back up against you. So a lot of these players that you see coming off the ground, like that Justin Thomas video, it's not that they're trying to jump out of their shoes to hit the ball. It's that they're pressing so aggressively into the ground that those forces, when they're pushing back up against their body are propelling them off the ground. Um, so that would be kind of the way I would talk about the vertical force guys. Um, you're more like rotational guys, you guys that are the really high torque players. Um, this is actually another very common way to use the ground. You know, players that have a, a lot more of a component of torque and rotational forces versus vertical force. Um, you know, those, those players can also use that very effectively. They tend to be players that really max out the way they use uh, rotational kinematics in their swing. They also tend to be players that create a tremendous amount of rotation, uh, both in the backswing and the downswing. So these are kind of your guys that generally have to be extremely flexible in order to really maximize their ability to use those rotational torque forces to a high power level. Um, again, you know, I think all of those do interact. I would just say of the three, we see less players that really max out the lateral element of their swing. We see a lot of players that max out the vertical element of the swing and certainly a significant number that are going to max out and, and primarily use those torque elements. Sure. Okay. Great questions, guys. We've got a couple more really good ones here. Uh, what about swinging in your socks or barefoot versus golf shoes and the effects of that? Nice. Woo. Go for right, it, Daisy. I'll, I'll take that one. So one thing that uh, kind of drives me a little bit insane is that I see a lot of people practicing in tennis shoes that like the Nike Roshis or the Nike Air Max and everything pushes the pressure down towards the toes. So footwear has a significant impact on pressure and force for sure. Because you've got to imagine, you know, look back to the history of weightlifting, you know, the shoes that they wear when they're Olympic lifting. They actually have wooden soles. It's because of that equal and opposite. If, if you can, if you're wearing a sole that's like a bubble, essentially that's just absorbing some of the force that you just work so hard to push down into the ground. So footwear is very, very important. And I actually love to do my super speed drills barefoot and practice hitting shots barefoot just to gain a proprioceptive awareness of where the pressure is going in the feet. Sometimes the shoes or the footwear is like a, a bubble wrap it wraps the foot so it has no sensory feelings of where it's pushing and i like to just take those shoes off have them feel it once they gain that feeling you'll probably see that their footwear is doing worse for them than good and you might encourage them to get some good footwear um but that's honestly how i would do it yeah, I think it definitely maxes out. There's different concerns there. Obviously, looking at stability in your feet and ankles is also important to choose the right shoes. Yeah. Uh, I know that, you know, Kyle and I, you know, ran a golf instruction academy in Chicago for a long time. And it was kind of funny because I, we would screen every single person that came in. And one of the first screens that we would do is we'd actually have them take off their shoes and socks. And we would just look to see if people could functionally use their toes anymore. And I mean, Kyle can reiterate, he did all those screens, but I mean, it's probably over 80% of the people that we screened certainly couldn't even get full separation between all of their toes and anymore. I think that's huge. Like if your feet aren't going to functionally work and your toes aren't able to feel, as Daisy said, and separate and create uh, points on the ground to create good pressure, or you don't have good arches, or there's a million different things that can, that can be physically connected to your ability to use the ground. I think looking and use, having your feet work functionally is a, is a really important thing. One of the fastest ways to start to improve that is to, you know, do a lot of work without your shoes on, um, or, you know, using the little five-toed shoes is something we would do a lot. Have people do different drills and exercises where they're scrunching towels or newspapers with their toes, um, all kinds of different things to try to improve people's dexterity and function in their feet was a big way to help people increase power in their golf swing. All right, a couple of questions for a tour. Um, can you talk about Tiger's well-known squat technique? Is it better to squat at the beginning of the downswing and push into the ground heading into impact or better to already have flex knees before starting the swings? Someone actually asked a similar question about um, whether there's a correlation between the lead knee flex and max forces. Um, I, I personally see a correlation with um, Sasho McKenzie's research with shaft vertical downswing um, being the time at which 
most good players apply max vertical force in their lead leg. There's obviously the element of timing to that, which is why the heel stomp drill is good. But what you'll tend to see is that when that, max, that lead leg force maxes out, it's in transition or just near shaft vertical. And that's when you'll see the lead knee most flexed. From there, it's a, it's a matter of rotating and pushing off the lead leg, extending that leg to transfer the force that you've just pressed into the ground up the leg through the body to the club. Yeah, you know, as, from the coaching perspective on this, I think, you know, there's a lot of preferences we may have as swing coaches uh, that we like to, to give our players, you know, many of those may deal with lower body posture during the golf swing. Um, I can say having coached a lot of uh, long drive professionals and, and as well as very, very powerful players, you generally see that type of emotion that Tiger does in a lot of your most powerful players, you know, where they're trying to gain, you know, a little bit of that, like press down even more in transition. You'll also also see it go down. You'll see them go away from the ball at that point. And then many of those players are going to see that kind of process sort of continue in the downswing. So uh, again, we have preferences maybe that we like as coaches where we want to see a lot of those angles stay very, very consistent throughout the swing. Um, you know, I could definitely see that being, a, being correlated to uh, consistency of exact distance and impact on the face. You know, definitely though, you can take advantage of some of those angles if you want to try to find other ways to create even additional power sources in your golf swing. The little squat motion that happens in Tiger Swing, again, very uh, typical in your long drive athletes as well. Certainly something that can add power and, and increased ground reaction force to the golf swing. All right, Mike, uh, I think you might have answered this like an over the top problem during the downswing. Should I fix my flaws first before I get a super speed set or should I go ahead and train while I notice I might have this downswing path flaw? Yeah, so I would absolutely start the training right away because, again, one of our goals with all of this that we're doing with Super Speed is helping you improve a lot of areas of your golf swing that you may not even know are wrong. If you do know that you have sort of an over-the-top kind of path, again, the biggest reason that that happens for players has nothing to do with their upper body or their arms or hands. It has to do with proper sequencing, proper pressure transfer in their lower body, which creates a situation where you know, the path of least resistance, if you will, for, their, for, their, for that player to get the club to the ball involves swinging a little bit more over the top. Now, this can be due to physical issues. It can be due to stability issues in the lower body. Maybe the most correlated side of here is something we call disassociation that we'll talk about in depth in our next webinar about rotational sequencing. But separating the lower body and the upper body. You know, if a player, if you're unable to do that or that's not something that's very comfortable for you, generally speaking, that's the number one reason people swing over the top. So, you know, our protocols, I'm not gonna say they're the end all be all and they're gonna fix this fix for, this everyone, for everyone. everyone. In general, when we, when we start to do these step change of direction swings, we start to do the heel stomp drill, um, we start to do these different motions, we tend to see better disassociation in the players after they've done those drills for a period of time. So, you know, in essence, sometimes that stuff can kind of fix itself. All right. Uh, interesting question here. What about the differences in uh, ground reaction force with men and women? What do we see there? Oh, it's a good question. Um, it's different for everyone, really, just dependent on how they're physically built. But uh, Ground force is a direct calculation of your mass and men tend to weigh a little more. So they tend to be able to, um, they have a bit more muscle mass. So they tend to be able to produce a little bit more force, but there's, I mean, I've seen some girls reach the same numbers as guys. So it's just dependent really. But uh, in general, because of muscle mass, sometimes the forces can be a little bit lower for, for women. Yeah, I'd say we also tend to see women being more flexible rotationally. So that kind of pieces them into some other things. Their swings tend to have to be a little longer um, in degrees of rotation. So that affects the way they use the ground as well. Yeah. Um, you know, not even specific to women, but I think another interesting point is remember, our speed pyramid starts with ground reaction force at the bottom and moves up to, you know, up the body, up through the rotational sequencing into the wrist. So I guess the, this is the way, if you have really good ground reaction forces, it gives you the potential to use all of those other characteristics of speed very well. It doesn't guarantee that you're gonna do so. In fact, you know, I heard a presentation not too long ago where 
you know, one of the, the most efficient players that, you know, uh, that somebody uses ground reaction forces all the time had ever seen, you know, in fact, really was maxing out not only vertical force, but, you know, torque in the swing, really one of the best ever was like a 16 handicap. And so you can never factor out the fact that players might just have never learned the skills they need to take advantage of using the ground really well. And because, again, this is kind of the initial starting point, again, this is a big one that looks at potential, not necessarily at end result. So that's one of the reasons you see a lot of variance in the way, uh, you know, body track uh, pressure traces and, and the amounts of vertical force and those things. There is a lot of variance out there from player to player, even at the highest level. Because again, this is the start, starting point. So there's a lot of other ways to compensate after you use this stuff, whether you use it well or not, to get the end result of hitting the ball in the club face. Still a very important thing to work on though, because we're all trying to increase our speed and power. And if it's something you're deficient in, because it's the base of that pyramid, it can also be the one that gets you some of the biggest gains um, if you do have a deficiency. All right, I think that's uh, good for today. So uh, anyone, once again, I want to reiterate, if you didn't receive the first webinar, please email us at info at superspeedgolf.com. Looks like we got most of the questions answered. Uh, also feel free to send your questions in that way. This will be uh, recorded and sent to you later this evening or tomorrow for the second one. And we will be having our next one sometime in June. Uh, so we'll get that information out to you guys. Look forward to uh, seeing everyone then. Mike and Daisy, anything else you want to add? No, just thank you very much for uh, spending some time with us this evening. We know everybody's busy, and, you know, we hope you got some stuff out of this tonight that might be able to help you with your golf game. Uh, and, you know, get out there and, and keep increasing that speed. Yeah, and I saw one, uh, one question in there about where to find the certification. You can just head to superspeedcertified.com, and that's where you can sign up to that content. Also, any inquiries about any information for BodyTrack, just go to their website, bodytrackperformance.com. And thank you guys for joining us. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.